All right. Uh, I cannot recap. The holidays have come and gone. Uh, and, and if you haven't remembered where we are, I think on the screen behind me it says the dispensation of the law. And your notes are limited, and we're actually going to take a little journey tonight into the word grace. That is not at all in your notes, so get your camera ready, because uh, there's a whole bunch of slides you're going to want about grace. Uh, we have been teaching on angels and demons, the spirit world, this unseen world that affects this world. There is a spiritual realm, and there is a physical realm, and they interact, they dissect Things that happen in the spirit world affect the physical realm. And believe it or not, things that happen in the physical realm can affect the spirit realm. Uh, we can have an effect in things unseen. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not telling you to walk around now with special glasses or whatever else, but you need to know this. The Bible's pretty clear that around you, most days of the week, there's conflict going on around you. And uh, some days it's worse than others. It depends what you're up to and what God is doing and what's going on in your life. But there will be days when the enemy attacks. Um, and I don't blame everything on the devil. You know, if your car breaks down and blows up and you need a new car, it's not the devil. It's got 380,000 miles on it. You haven't changed the oil in six months. It's you. It's not the devil, all right? You got family conflict. It's probably not the devil. One of you is just being a little nasty. Straighten it out. I believe the devil is a master of seizing the moment and the opportunity. So I believe that if the devil sees conflict in your marriage, the devil will try to move into that. Like a, like a snake around your house looking for a way in. In other words, if there's a crack, if there's a door open, in other words, that, that serpent will find a way in. And so we've been trying to close off some of those things, make ourselves more aware and understand greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We're not afraid of the devil. But we also don't, we don't just treat it like nothing, like, oh, pff, don't worry, he's defeated. I, I know he's defeated, but he, he's still a pretty, pretty incredible enemy, and you should be on your toes, and you should put on the armor of the Lord every day of your life, or you're going to be in trouble. And so what this led into was we found and we discovered that through humanity, God is revealing the plan of the universe. Um, and I, I, I don't know how to break this to you if you're, if you're new joining us tonight. What we discovered uh, eight weeks ago was this, is that <laughs> God's got a big, big plan going on. And we're just a little part of it. Sometimes, again, because we think we're the center of the universe. We think we're all it. Now, listen, we are. This planet plays an integral part in the universe. This is where God will set up his eternal kingdom. So the earth is not by any stretch of the imagination minute or unimportant. But there's a much bigger picture going on. This universe was perfect. Uh, again, I cannot go back. So if I sound a little weird or Star Wars on you, just listen to the last eight weeks. All right. But this universe was perfect. The planets were inhabited. There were beings that dwelt on the planets and they worshiped the Most High. Angelic beings ruled the universe. And one of them, his name was Lucifer. He was in charge of this planet, and he was in charge of worship in the universe. And the Bible says that in his being, he is a musical instrument. Not he carries one around in him, part of him. He has pipes in him. He's not a little guy with a red suit and pitchfork and, you know, the horns. He is an incredible angelic being that God created. And out of him, music plays. And the whole universe would worship God. And the Bible says one day... Because whenever you praise and worship, and whenever, and, and my brother Jason is really good at this. He keeps our band in pretty good, pretty good spiritual place. Whenever you get involved in praise and worship, it's a dangerous place to be. Because you are moving, one, into the spiritual realm. Two, you're in the spotlight. You're seen. Uh, and, and so a lot of times uh, we need to be careful that we don't worship worship or worship leaders, that we worship Jesus. Amen. We're here to worship him. Amen. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe that doesn't mean we shouldn't do worship well. It shouldn't be done well, but it needs to be more than a performance. It needs to bring people into the presence of the Lord. Amen. But when you do that, there's danger. And so Lucifer gets full of pride. He says, I will be like the Most High. And the Bible says that he took a third of the angelic beings in the universe. And I, I don't have chapter and verse for this in the Bible, but I'm, someone asked me a little while ago, they said, oh, so you just like add to that to make it make sense. I'm like... I really don't want to hit you now. I was like the Pope. I was going to slap him. Uh, they said, oh, you just kind of add to that to kind of make it make sense. I'm like, Tsh. 
I'm not adding to it. I'm, it's pretty clear in Scripture, and it's logical. I don't believe that the devil one day woke up and said, I'm going to rise up against God, and this was on a Monday, and by Tuesday afternoon, he had a third of the angelic hosts agreeing with him to go war against God. Does that make sense to you? No. So logically, I believe that it took time. How much time? We have no idea. 10,000 years? A million years? I don't know. But Lucifer went throughout the universe and he convinced the third of the angelic host to rise up with him. And there was war in the heavenlies. The universe was sent into chaos. A sinless, perfect universe went into chaos. This earth was destroyed and God suddenly steps back and lets a whole bunch of time go by. And then God, in his love and in his redemptive plan, creates this incredible plan that through mankind he will send a redeemer. Not only to save mankind, but to put the universe right. And I'm not diminishing what Christ has done for mankind. But some people, their theology is is that Christ died just for mankind. That was the vehicle that he used, but God had a bigger plan. God is going to put the whole universe right. One day the devil and the third of his angels are going to be gone forever. The heavenlies will once again be inhabited with beings. We will worship the King of glory forever and forever and forever. And the universe will be ours. Woo, glory, hallelujah. And God is going to put that all back together through the man, Christ Jesus. And so we learned a whole bunch of weeks ago, I said I'm going to recap. <laughs> but that, that was a good recap. It was exciting, wasn't it? It was good, yeah. If you like Star Wars, you'll love that recap. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, what we learned was is that through the dispensations, through mankind, God is literally showing to the courts of heaven, to the angelic host, He is showing them His plan. Because they didn't get it all. They didn't know what God was doing. And it, it says that through the church and through mankind, He reveals what His plan is. And so we've traveled through five dispensations. Uh, every one of them has nine attributes Uh, I'm sorry if that's boring you. It's in your notes. We're going to look at one tonight that pretty much every Christian knows. We looked at the dispensation of innocence, the dispensation of promise, and uh, pretty much every uh, theologian or great Bible teacher. I'm not one. I've I've read this in other people's writings, but uh, anybody that you read believes that there will be seven full human dispensations. There will be an eighth one. We'll talk about that probably next week. But that will involve angelic beings and the eternal universe. So there are seven that deal specifically with mankind. We've dealt with uh, how many of them? <laughs> We've dealt with five of them. Uh, we got two more left. I'm, I'm going to tell you right up front tonight, I'm not going to do the millennial tonight. We're going to do it next week because when I do the millennial, I want the whole 45 minutes because we're going to talk about some of the things in Revelation and some of the signs of the end times. We are living right at I'm telling you, Satan's knocking on the door, I'm telling you. The world is getting ready for the Antichrist. You only got to watch political news. Last week, I I said I'll save it for next week. Last week you saw China, Russia, and Iran uh, have some war games just south of the Straits of uh, Hormuz there, or Vermouth, whatever it is they're drinking there. Yeah. and, and, and Washington gets a little upset. Listen, if you're a child of God, and, and I'll, I'll talk more about this next week, but if you're a child of God, you could not ask for a more definitive sign that Jesus is coming soon. Uh, for the Battle of Armageddon, Russia and China will have to move across south, down towards Israel. They'll need a path. The path will be through Iran, through Syria, and that's where, where they're now gaining footholds in territory. And uh, people saying, oh, I don't know why we left. I don't know what we're doing. God is moving it all around. Oh, God's in control. God's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and the devil's trying to fight it, but God is going to say, checkmate. And here comes the king. Hallelujah. Amen. So I want to talk to you tonight about one of my favorite dispensations. The reason it's one of my favorite, whoo, it's because it's the one that gave me a chance <laughs> and gave me hope. And it's the one that most Christians know about. If you talk to almost any Christian, they'll be able to tell you, we live in the dispensation of... Woo! See, I told you. Hallelujah. I thank God for all the old dispensations. I thank God for what he was doing in them. But we're going to talk to you tonight about the dispensation of grace. And I'm going to kind of go quickly through the nine steps. Not because you don't need to know them. Not because they're not important and they're not in your notes. Again, I don't apologize. If I gave you the notes, you'd just stay home. 
So get your phone out, take a picture if you want, and then also know this, that when we're finished with this in a couple of weeks, I've already told you, we're going to make a link on our website or on our app where you'll be able to download everything, all my notes, everything I've taught, all the graphs, all the charts, everything. You'll be able to have it for $89.99, three easy payments, no, for free. You'll be able to get it for nothing. We're going to give it to you for nothing. So uh, you'll be able to get that in a month or so, when we're in a couple of weeks when we're finished. See that month, a couple of weeks, something like that. Um, uh, this age has already lasted approximately 2,000 plus years. From the first coming of Christ to Bethlehem, and it shall continue until the second coming of Christ in the near future. How much longer the age will last is really unknown to us at this point. Because every dispensation we've looked at up until now had a start point and an end point. The one we're going to look at tonight has had a start point, but we haven't hit the end point yet. So we're not, I, I can't give you a date. Some of these, we've said, some of these dispensations lasted 450 years, some 1,700 years. Uh, again, someone asked the question, man, why would God wait that long? It's not that God is waiting, it's that God is patient. God keeps waiting for us to get it right. Knowing that we won't, he makes a way of escape. So uh, the nine steps or the nine facts about each dispensation, uh, can I give them to you really quick? Uh, and then I want to talk to you about grace for about 10 minutes tonight. And she's not a blue-eyed blonde. Who preached that sermon? Was that Dave Wilkes? Was that my dad preached that sermon years ago? Grace is not a blue-eyed blonde. <laughs> That's a way to get people to church, huh? Nice going, DJ. Very good. Grace is not a blue-eyed blonde. I don't know why that hit me when I said that. Uh, let's go through them. Number one is the name. I've already given it to you, but if you want a picture of it, there it is. The name is the dispensation of grace. So-called because of the fullness of grace. When you get this in your notes, or if you're taking a picture, you should circle that. This is the first dispensation where mankind is living with the fullness of grace. Uh, in every dispensation, there has been grace. There has been some measure of mercy, some measure of forgiveness uh, in all previous dispensations, but not in fullness. Uh, the same was true of the law, actually. Uh, the fullness of the law came through Jesus Christ. So, the name is the dispensation. Duh, that's number one. Two, the length. It is from the preaching of the kingdom. Remember, a couple weeks ago I told you that if you read the New Testament, when Jesus first appears, when John is first preaching uh, in the book of, in, in Gospel of Matthew, they are preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom. They're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They're preaching to Jews. They're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It's the beginning of the message of grace. And so it starts from the preaching of the kingdom of heaven by John to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to pause there because there's some debate over this and there are lots of things we teach and you understand that most of what we teach um, uh, can have what I believe in the church age today is we should have an open-handed kind of policy about most things. In other words, we're teaching that we believe in the rapture of the church. There are some people that believe in post-trip, mid-trip, pre-trip. Uh, I don't care which one you believe in as long as you believe in the rapture. Now, if you don't believe in the rapture, I, I got a problem with it because the Bible speaks pretty clearly about it. Um, and, and there's some churches that don't preach uh, the rapture of the church. They believe the rapture is a metaphorical thing or a, a, a spiritual thing that happens. It isn't. Jesus is going to come take us out of this place one day. Say amen. amen. But I don't, I don't get into big debates. People come to me and they say, Pastor, I want to have a debate with you. You know, was it pre-trip, post-trip? I don't care. I'm not, I wouldn't fight about it. It's not that big of an issue. One day, we're going to go to heaven. We're all going to go at the same time. And I'm going to go, yo, you were wrong. Let's go. It's, it'll be okay. It's okay. It'll all work out. We're both going. Amen? Now, would I debate and would I argue with, or would I debate someone over some issues that are close-handed? Yes. That Jesus Christ is the only way into heaven. If someone comes to me and says, well, pastor, you know, I'm starting to think this. I'm saying, whoa, no, wait, we got to sit down. Let's look at scripture. That's not what the Bible says. We can't let go of that. Amen? Amen. So uh, what I'm about to share with you now, uh, I have an opinion about it, but it, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it's, it's somewhat irrelevant. But I, I think it's, by that, I don't want to let you think that we just ought to have a kind of a lazy attitude about things. I, I think you ought to search scripture, seek out God's wisdom, seek out men more intelligent, or women more intelligent, teachers more intelligent, and get a right answer. I don't think you've got to say, well, it doesn't matter. Try to find the right answer. So I'll usually tell you what I believe. You could probably bank on that one most of the time. I'm not right about everything, but I've done my homework. 
Uh, I just want to kind of draw your attention to that, uh, from the preaching of the kingdom to the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are some that teach that at the rapture of the church, the dispensation of grace ends. That like the shutting of Noah's ark, uh, that once the rapture happens, you cannot get, be saved after that. No one will be saved after that. And there are a lot of, I'm not going to name them, but there's a lot of famous Bible teachers and men much smarter than me that, that teach that. I don't happen to believe that because I find in Scripture that there are people who are still on the planet who are discovering Christ, who are being witnessed to, who are being put to death by the Antichrist for following Jesus Christ. So if we're all gone in the rapture, who are the people that are being put to death by the Antichrist? There are people, they're your loved ones. Think about some of your loved ones. If the rapture happened tomorrow, think about it. Millions of people disappeared. Don't you think some of your relatives would say, dude, Aunt Gladys was right. I mean, seriously, don't you think some of your friends would be at least interested? Even CNN would probably cover the rapture. Just saying. Uh, the news would come. No, people would be intrigued. There would be some people who would seek. They would come to church. They'd come to this church. Uh, my dad, when they built this church, when this church was built, I forget what the year is now, 80, 82. I knew my mother would know. Look at that, 82. She can't remember where she went yesterday, but 1982, <laughs> baby. She got it. She could tell you who was there, who spoke. I'm telling you. Uh, in the cornerstone of this building, there's a cornerstone over this, got my dad's name on it, and it says, uh, there's a verse of scripture, it says, unless they build the house uh, in the name of the Lord, that it, they labor in vain, that, that build the house without the name of the Lord. So it's a great portion of scripture. And if you smash out that, I'm just letting you know, you should tell your loved ones, put it on Facebook. If you smash out that cornerstone, there's a sealed capsule in there. And in that capsule, there's all kinds of books on how to survive the tribulation, What's going on in the world? Look out for the Antichrist. Don't take the mark of the beast. There's a couple hundred bucks. and There's not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> See, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> there's no money in there. There's some stupid bitcoins or something. But no, there's no money in there. Uh, but, but there's a bunch of books. and I forgot all about that. Now I, I, I forgot. That's a long time ago. Man, we did that. I forgot all about that. So there's a time capsule in there. And there's some cassette tapes. But, but no one's going to be able to listen to those, Mom. I don't know what to tell you. Mom, that was the only part you weren't thinking about. I'm just telling you right now. They'll be looking. What is this strange device? Does anyone have a number two pencil? Young people right now are going, what? When you get home, explain that to young people, all right? The number two pencil. Uh, 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 listen. Uh, so I don't believe that the dispensation of grace ends at the rapture. I believe it does end when Jesus comes back. That there is coming a time when it is too late. Uh, human beings had grace, like I said, uh, in all. Uh, considering that we reckon our time in A.D. from the birth of Christ uh, and that he was about 30 years of age in A.D. 30 when John the Baptist announced the kingdom, we know that by the year 2000, and look, we've just crossed into 2020, so you do the math. That's, this is the last time I taught this, 2000, uh, uh, that we know that we've come 1,900 plus years, in other words. Uh, we are closer than we have ever been. How many more years? Grace will continue is not known because we don't know when the second coming is. And just if you're a new Christian, those are terms that sometimes Christians kind of intertwine and get mixed up. Uh, the rapture of the church is not the second coming of Jesus Christ. So at the rapture of the church, Jesus doesn't come to planet earth. The Bible says we are caught up to meet him in the sky. He comes close. He comes to get us, but he waits for us in the clouds. Hallelujah. Uh, when he comes the second time, he lands in Jerusalem. His feet touch the Mount of Olives. We'll talk about it next week. His, the mountain splits into, Ooh, man, it's an awesome time. Uh, anyways, uh, students of prophecy believe it will however be soon. Grace cannot end, I believe, until the ten kingdoms are formed inside the old Roman Empire. We'll talk about that next week during the millennial, or to bring in the millennial reign. Uh, and until the Antichrist has been here for seven years after the rapture of the church. Okay? A lot of stuff there. Uh, the favor will be beginning. Number three, remember every dispensation, God starts us off on the right foot. Uh, by that I mean it could work. It, th there's hope in it. There, there, there's this a favorable beginning. So when you look at the beginning of this 
gospel of grace. What? Satan was defeated on the cross? I mean, think about it. We're starting a new dispensation. God says, we're getting ready. We're going to start a new one. This one, let's defeat the devil. So he has no power over mankind. He's a defeated foe. I don't know about you. That's a pretty favorable beginning. That's better than living under the law. Amen? Uh, so Satan is defeated on the cross. He's been made powerless. Uh, he can now be overcome by any believer who will put on the whole armor of God and resist him. Now, I said earlier, when I say he's defeated foe, I don't think you ought to walk around kind of just, you know, jumping around in your gym shorts like, you know, we beat the devil. Put on the armor of the Lord. And you better pray every day. You've got to resist him. But here's what I know. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And don't tell me, oh, the devil made me do it. That's Flip Wilson. There's another time capsule for you. All right? The devil didn't make you do it. You can have victory over sin. God is greater, amen, than all of our addictions and our predilections and everything else. Listen, in this matter, no difference was made now between Jew or gentle, male or female. Furthermore, the dispensation of grace began with ministries of power, miracles, that of Christ, John the Baptist, the apostles, and other men endued to perform miracles. I mean, you're starting off this new dispensation. People are getting healed, raised from the dead. I mean, you talk about, man, we're starting off. Whoo, this thing's, we're on the winning team here. Even the dead are, are being brought back to life, okay? Uh, it, it began with complete grace, uh, a promise of the fullness of the Spirit. So not only uh, are we going to be able to know Jesus, but now the Holy Spirit is going to dwell inside us. There's a full commission to represent God and do the works of Christ. All the scriptures are there. Take a picture. You can look these up. So now there is no limitation to the believer regarding what he wants from God according to his promises. We've stepped into this dispensation of grace where now we can live in victory. We can live in freedom. We have hope. We have hallelujah. It's got a favorable beginning. Every dispensation has a test. Number four is the test. The test is simple. Obedience to the faith of the gospel in all of its teachings. Just just obey God's word, revel in his love, worship him, live in grace, walk in grace, survive in grace, stop trying to do it yourself, and rest in him. Uh, It is the easiest dispensation up to this present time that, that we're talking about dispensations. Because even the test in this dispensation really has nothing to do with us. It has to do with resting in the grace that he has provided. So remember in every other dispensation, the test was don't do this, don't touch that, (laughs) got to do this, got to wear that, don't cut your hair, do this, don't do that. There were all these things that we had to do. In In this dispensation, all we have to do is believe the gospel and abide in the gospel. And we're going to make it. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? The purpose of it, every dispensation has a purpose, the, person, the purpose of it is to save any and all who would believe. To call out a people for his name and to build up the church. Now, uh, you may in the church today, if you read some Christian magazines, uh, and some are still Christian, some aren't. <laughs> uh, if you read any Christian journals or read any Christian stuff, uh, you will read sometimes of... Uh, uh, a thing called hyper grace. Uh, there are certain preachers, again, that I could mention, some world famous, uh, that teach a doctrine of hyper grace. Uh, I, I don't believe in it. Uh, anytime you put the word hyper in front of something, you, you, you're in for trouble. <laughs> hyper speed, <laughs> hyper. Let's slow down a little bit here. Uh, and so there are some who teach today. Uh, uh, Joseph Prince would be one of them. So let me just pull a name out of my hat for you. Uh, Joseph Prince would be one of them, uh, who teach hyper grace. That in essence, everybody is already saved, they just don't know it yet. And that everyone will end up in heaven. Now, they haven't come to a place yet where they confess, well then, is there a hell? Because that's the other side of hyper grace. So then why is there a hell if everybody's going to make it? So I want you to understand this, that although this dispensation is glorious and wonderful and it is the will of Father that none should perish, I want you to understand that the purpose of God is to save all who will believe. So there's still a prerequisite. You cannot just get in because you're in this dispensation. Just like all the other ones, you can't get in on the promise 
the dispensation of promise just because you lived when Abraham did. You can't get in on the dispensation of law just because you're around when Moses was. No, you've got to obey the law. You've got to receive the gospel. You've got to receive God's grace. Amen? Amen? Sorry, but I taught this years ago, and it's amazing how much the world has changed. The last time I taught this, there was no such thing as hyper-grace. There, was, there, were nobody, there are books today on hyper-grace, and everybody's forgiven, and God loves everybody, and God isn't mad at anybody. Stupidest junk I've ever read in all the world. So anyway, uh, the means of God accomplishing his purpose in this dispensation. God always has a means, a tool, a vehicle for accomplishing it. Uh, and, and in this dispensation, it is preaching the gospel is his means to call people out for the church. So the way people get saved is by the preaching of the gospel. Faith comes by hearing. Amen. Uh, for this work, he uses called and gifted men and women. When I say men there, you understand I'm using the King James. I mean men and women, mankind, but I'll say it sometimes. For this work, he uses gifted men and women. God has given gifts to the church, the five-fold ministry gifts. Do you know them? You should. It's easy to remember them. Write these on your finger. Watch, ready? The, the New Testament calls the five-fold ministry gifts. I put myself on the spot here now. I better get them right. Uh, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. You say, man, how'd you remember that? I just, did you see me looking at my fingers? <laughs> I learned this years ago. Watch, you'll, if you learn this, you'll never forget them. What's an apostle? An apostle is a special messenger sent by God for a special season, a special time. The way to identify an apostle is this. They usually touch all the other ministry gifts. Paul the apostle was also an incredible teacher. He was also a pastor. He built churches. He was an incredible evangelist. He did all of those things. So an apostle is not somebody who just gets a little storefront church and prints a business card up that says, First Church of the Holy Dewey Decimal Apostleship of the Lord Jesus Christ of the Methodist movement, of the inner city global evangelistic outreach center. <laughs> and the longer the name is, the smaller the storefront is. All right? Just because you call yourself an apostle doesn't make you an apostle. You've you got to touch all the... All right? You're, they're, they're far and few between. I, I've met a few apostles, but they're pretty rare. Uh, the, the other gift God gives the church is the prophet. That's how you remember the prophet. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. I've known a few prophets. Um, prophets are wonderful people. Uh, we love to hear them, but it's usually when they go off, they're like alarm clocks. When they go off, we usually go, stop, enough. Because what they say is usually pretty blunt. Thus saith the Lord. Repent, turn, you're going to die. It, it's usually a message of woe, doom, the prophet. Uh, prophets don't make very good pastors. It, it can happen, but they don't usually make very good pastors. Nobody goes to their church for long. You know, every Sunday, you're not going to hell. What's Don Brank, what does Dave Grant say? Two shall be in a bed. Neither one are going. Two shall be in a field. Both are left behind. That's the voice of the prophet, in other words. Uh, I didn't mean to get into all this. Uh, the evangelist is next. And, and if, if you're looking for these in the Bible, th these finger things are not in the Bible, all right? This is <laughs> see some people writing these down. I've got to look this up when I get home. Just something I made up to help me remember, all right? Apostle touches them all. Prophet Evangelist. The reason I, this makes me remember the evangelist, why? Because the message of the evangelist must be the tallest and the most paramount and the most important message of the church. Right. If your church becomes all about teaching, all about uh, uh, apostleship, all about prophetic word, but you're not winning the lost, we're not doing what the gospel of grace is all about. So the number one message must be reach the lost, reach the lost, reach the lost. Amen? Amen. Uh, the next finger is the pastor, uh, and he cares for the sheep. And the reason I use this finger to remember him by is because that's the wedding finger. So he looks after the bride of Christ. And the pastor cares for the church. We have some incredible pastors in this church. I'm not one of them, but we have some incredible, incredible pastors. We really do. They love people. They care about people. I kind of tolerate you. And if you grab my hand on the way out, I'm slapping your wrist. I'm just telling you. So uh, even great shepherds do that, all right? You knew I was going to have fun with that, right? It's too good. It's too good not to have fun. God bless him. I don't blame her. I had a dector for Jesus. Anyway, listen. <laughs> I had to dump security on her. Grab her! Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and who's last? Oh, the teacher. Uh, and, and the reason this one makes me think of the teacher, it's kind of gross, but, but here's what a teacher does, is when you, really, you read something, you go, I, I really can't, I can't understand that. Um, ah! It kind of clears stuff out of the way, all right? That is really gross, man. What is that? No, it's nothing. Uh, uh, and so uh, that's the five-fold ministry gift, all right? Didn't mean to give you those tonight, but it's fun. 
they're an important part of the dispensation of grace. During the dispensation of grace, God is using those five things to call a lost people unto salvation. So I've kind of joked about them, but you, you should treat them with respect and reverence and thank God for the fivefold ministry gift. It's what called you out of darkness into light. Somebody taught you something you didn't know. Somebody prophesied over you and said, man, the way you're headed is doom and destruction. Uh, my dad met in that office back there with one of the deacons in our church, Phil Vega. His wife was coming to this church. He was a wonderful Christian. Phil was a, just an avid drunk. <laughs> he was a professional drunk. And my dad sat in that office with him back there, and, and him and Millie's marriage was about to tear apart. And my dad sat in that office, and a lot of pastors would have said, well, you know, we need to get you in a recovery group, and we got to get you. And my dad, I believe, led by the Holy Spirit, sat in that office and said to him, listen to me, sir. If you do not surrender your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ, your marriage is doomed, your children will curse you, your wife will hate you, you'll spend eternity burning forever in a lost hell, and that is your future unless you turn from this foolishness. And he cried like a baby in that office, got down on his knees and accepted Jesus Christ. Now, there were a lot of people praying, but God used a prophetic word to tell him that that, this is your doom. It wasn't a message of love. It was a message of fear. This is where you're headed if you don't turn around. And someone loved you. Some pastor cared about you. Some, some apostle spoke into your life. Some brother, some sister. Thank God for the five-fold ministry gift. Amen? I'm just looking at the clock. You realize I'm not going to get to what I want. Okay. Uh, uh, why do these things take so long? Um, uh, for his work, he has called and, and uses gifted men and women, the five-fold ministry gift. Uh, he also uses angels in this dispensation, Hebrews chapter 1, 14. You can read about that. And he uses, and I I don't mean a a, a derogatory sense in that, ordinary saved men and women uh, to propagate the gospel as directed by the Holy Spirit. When I say ordinary, I I just mean ordinary in the sense of, look, when I'm not here being a pastor, I'm just an ordinary guy. When I'm at a restaurant, I'm just an ordinary guy. Uh, And when I'm out there being an ordinary guy, guess what? The Holy Spirit can still use me. I'm not preaching a sermon. I'm not teaching. I'm just living the life. I'm sharing light. Uh, And and can I tell you... uh, I've probably won more people to Christ in the house of God because this is my vocation, but I certainly want a lot of people to Christ out there just being an ordinary guy, just being who God needs me to be. And that's what God has called you to do because your full-time job is not this. Your full-time job is something out there that is your ministry, your calling, and you can use that. You work where I'll never work. You work where no prophet or priest or pastor will ever walk. You work in a building where no one will ever hear about Jesus unless you bring the light of the gospel. And that's your job in this dispensation. How exciting is that? Amen? Yeah. Stop looking at your job like it's boring. Look at it like you're a missionary. I mean, go make some money tomorrow. I got nothing against making money. You need this God. Make some money tomorrow. Sell a house if you're in real estate. Make some money if you're an investor. Don't burn the french fries if you work at McDonald's. Make some money. But whatever you do, if you're working at McDonald's, know this, that the girl over there at the other fry later, she's probably never going to hear about Jesus unless you talk to her about Jesus. What an awesome responsibility is ours. Amen? Amen. Uh, The failure, the failure is threefold. Uh, There's three failures, but there's always a failure. Uh, There is the failure of Israel, and I'm not going to talk long on this, just take a picture of it. Uh, It is seen in their rejection of John, Jesus, and the apostles in the crucifixion of their Messiah. They fail the message of the kingdom. The message of grace comes first to the Jew, and they reject it. Uh, He came to his own, and his own received him not. Uh, His own brothers and sisters turned from him. And as sad as that news is for us as Gentiles, there's also some hope in it, in that because they rejected it, the message was brought to us. Amen? Amen. So thank God that grace spreads to all. Amen? Uh, And and so uh, because Israel would not obey, uh, the message of the kingdom has been taken from them and given to the whosoever. Uh, The early church also failed. Uh, or began to fail, I should say, God, in the very beginning. Read in Acts, read in uh, 1 Corinthians, read in Galatians, that what you read about is division, strife, heresies, unclean living, false leaders. Sounds pretty much like today, doesn't it? We never change. We're a rotten bunch, I'm telling you. Um, And and so the early church began to fail. Uh, And then the post-apostolic church continued in failure, not evangelizing the world. They weren't living clean lives. They didn't preach the whole truth uh, or be one. There wasn't unity in in the body of Christ. And the church actually entered into what history actually refers to as the Dark Ages, uh, where popes and and 
kings and queens and all kinds of people ruled over man and, and uh, civil rulers. And they murdered millions who would not conform to organized religion that there was no hope in. And then finally, one day, there was a great reformation. Thank God for the reformation. I said, thank God for the reformation. See, this is why you got to teach on dispensations. You people don't even know that you're Protestants. I, I love you. I know, I know lots of you. How many of you came from the Catholic Church? How many of you are former Catholic? Wow. Blessing. Awesome. Um, and, and I don't want to shake you up, but, and, but, but you need to know this. You're in a Protestant church. And, and the reason you're in a Protestant church is because you heard the truth of the gospel. And that gospel truth woke you up. So I'm not here to make a big fight or bash anybody, but I'm just telling you, there are 800 million Catholics in the world today who still think they're going to heaven, and most of them are not. And every once in a while, the Protestant church ought to remember that it's Protestant. The word comes from protest. What we protested was the falsehoods of Rome. And every once in a while, the church ought to be brave enough to stand up and say, that is not the answer. This is the truth. And I'm, I'm in that. Now, don't, don't send me an email. I didn't, I didn't say all Catholics are not saved. Nobody in the Catholic Church is going to heaven. I didn't say that. <laughs> I said that Catholic doctrine and Catholic dogma will not get you into heaven. Only Jesus Christ will get you into heaven. Amen. And we came out of the dark ages through the Reformation. And that's why we're here. That's why we're Protestants. Every once in a while, you ought to protest. Not violently, but you have to get a little sign that says Jesus is the only way. So, and that's why sometimes I, I know, and I, we get people upset sometimes. I'll say something like, you know, I said a couple weeks ago, I was preaching at Christmas, and I said, the wise men came, and I want you to notice they didn't bow down and worship Mary. They worshiped the baby Jesus. I just, I just kind of, I just kind of remind you, we're, we're Protestants. We don't worship Mary. I, I can't wait to get to meet her. She's going to be in heaven. I'm not in her neighborhood, I know, <laughs> but I'm going to get a pass into the little gated section and because she got a huge house. I mean, imagine Mary's house. Come on. Come on. Her son's a Jewish carpenter. You think she's living in a little bungalow somewhere? I don't think so. He's like, my mom, she's living over there. Yeah. I, I think Jesus took care of her. I can't wait to meet her. But when you meet her there, she's going to tell you, thank you for letting people know I couldn't get people in. Only Jesus could. She bowed at the cross just like we need to. Amen. So, uh, in love, I say that to you. If, and if you're a former Catholic, remind yourself, don't go around saying, I'm, I'm a Catholic. I'm a, you're not a Catholic. I love you. If you've found Christ, if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, you're coming to new life. I, I, I don't know how to break this to you. You're not a Catholic. What? <laughs> what? I never switched. I never... <laughs> I don't know how to tell it to you, buddy. I don't know how to tell. I'm sorry to break your, I'm sorry to break your heart and ruin your bubble, but go ask the Pope. You're not a Catholic anymore. You're going to Assembly of God, Pentecostal, right. Holy Ghost, tongue-talking, yeah. evangelical, grace-filled, glorious church. Hallelujah. Stop telling people, oh, I'm a Catholic, but I'm an excited one. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I'm, I'm a Catholic, but I'm born again. Stop it. Just, I'm born again. Amen. I'm a Christian. You don't have to have a brand. Don't, don't tell people I'm an AG or don't tell people I'm, I'm a new lifer. Stop. I'll slap you. Yeah. Don't go around and tell, are you a believer? No, I'm a new lifer. Yeah. We got a lot of sinners going to this church. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. On a Thursday night. Yeah, we do. Got a lot of sinners here tonight. All right? We got sinners here. Don't. But... Oh, bless God. I had two whole pages I want to give you here. Listen. Uh, the judgment for sin. There's always a judgment. Again, these are difficult things to cover, but in every dispensation there's a judgment. Uh, listen, for their rejection of John and Jesus and the early disciples, Israel was destroyed as a nation. They were destroyed in 70 AD as a nation. Now, we'll, we'll come to God's redemption in a second, but you need to understand that in other words. Because of their rejection, Jews have suffered. They have suffered under almost every world political power that has ever been. We are seeing today, I should save this for next week, but we are seeing again, in, even in our own nation, right here in New York City, we are seeing anti-Semitism on the rise. 
Jesus. These are signs of the time. Uh, the Jew will always be persecuted. Why? Because they rejected the Christ. They said, let his blood be on us and on our children's children's children. At the cross, they said that. Let his blood be on us and on our children's children. You know, so they, they, were, they have been rejected. They have been set aside. And so that doesn't mean a Jew can't get saved. That doesn't mean a Jew isn't still God's chosen people. God, God doesn't change. We, we step out, but God still loves. Amen? There's still the apple of his eye. Don't, don't you say anything negative about a Jew. You should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. When you see a Jew, bless a Jew. <laughs> I'm just telling you, they're the apple of God's eye. Even though right now they're unfaithful. Ugh, I got enough time to say it. And you remember a couple weeks ago, we taught that the Jew is the bride of God. We forget this as the church because we're so into being the bride of Christ. We, we are the bride of Christ. The Jew is the bride of Christ. The, 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 Christ the, the church, rather, sorry, is the bride of Christ. But the Jew is the bride of God. Read the Old Testament. What does he say to Israel? Thou hast been unfaithful, you adulterous woman. She's a woman. She's a woman. She's, a woman. She's the bride of God. She was the original bride. But because she, was, she rejected him, God had to send his son. And in Old Testament typology, what does Abraham do? He sends out the unnamed servant, the Holy Spirit, into a far country to bring back a bride for his son, which is what God has done. God has sent the Holy Spirit into the world to bring a bride for his son, Isaac. Yeah. Woo, we are Rebecca. Glory. Hallelujah. And, and, and read it in Genesis. I think it's Genesis chapter 50, 51. If I'm wrong, don't, don't, email, don't text. Don't put it on Facebook. I was wrong, all right? I really will slap you, all right? But it's somewhere around there, all right? Been a long time since I read it, too. But, but what you'll find is this, is that when, when, when the servant comes back with the bride for Isaac, and it says he, he falls down and he worships her, he loves her. He takes her unto himself in his tent. They become one flesh. It's the, it's the marriage uh, of, the, of the, the bride and the groom, in other words. The, the marriage supper of the lamb takes place in typology. And, and, and it says this, and Abraham, and he's ancient. Dude, he's ancient of days by now. His wife has died. Sarah has been dead a long, long time. He now knows that his son has a bride. And the Bible says, and Abraham looks upon the women of his people. And he chooses a bride, an old man. And it says he takes a new wife unto himself and takes her unto his tent and he knows her and they are one. And it's, I'll show it to you next week in the millennial. It is, it is listen, we're going to be the bride of Christ, but God is going to regather the Jew. Once the church has been taken up to glory, God will once again work on Israel and bring himself, his bride back. God's doing a thing in the universe. Amen? Uh, I didn't mean to get into all that. Ugh. Listen, uh, they will not be fully restored, I believe, until the second coming of Christ. Now, Israel has been restored, but I said fully restored. So they don't have all the land that was promised to them. They don't have everything God has promised them, but they will have it. It's coming. Uh, this dispensation will, will end with a great apostasy. At the end of the dispensation of grace, there will be a huge falling away. And, and we're seeing this. While there's a great revival happening in America, there's also a great falling away. Uh, and the question is asked in Luke. It says, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And then the judgment will include the greatest tribulation ever known on earth. The great tribulation. We'll talk about it a little bit next week. Uh, and then ninth, and I'll let you go home because they flashed the light at me. Uh, God's provision of redemption. Uh, there's always a provision. At the, the, ninth, the ninth step in every dispensation is God gives us a way out. Hallelujah. The provision for this period and every other one is the death of Christ on the cross. People in previous dispensations looked forward to it by faith to receive its benefits. People now look back in faith to receive its benefits. People looked for the cross, we look back to the cross. But it's still the cross. <laughs> uh, listen, man, the cross is the center of the universe. Whichever way you stand, you got to get cross-eyed. You, you got to look to the center. You got to look back to Jesus. He's the only way. Amen. God sent his son to take the place of all persons in death so that all who will believe might be fully redeemed, reconciled, reconciled and restored to original dominion. Now listen, uh, most of this morning I spent doing two pages on uh, helping you understand what grace really is because it's been miscommunicated in our modern culture today. So if you come next week, and I, I got to say a huge apology to Debbie Lopez. She worked hard this afternoon getting in 
25 new slides and two whole new pages of notes. She said, are you sure you're going to get to them? I said, I'm going to get there. I'm definitely going to do it. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but I'm gonna, so we'll do that next week, and we'll jump into the millennial. So next week, we'll, I'll just show you quickly what I, what I wrote out here about grace, because I want you to understand it. Uh, and if you don't know anybody who's saved, bring them next, Sunday, uh, next Thursday night. We'll talk about grace for a couple minutes. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, the dispensation of divine government called the millennial. We'll talk about that uh, next Thursday night. Don't forget to read Exodus chapter 19 and 20. If you read it before Sunday morning, you'll come tuned in. When I'm saying something, you'll go, oh, I know that bit. Oh, I know what's going on. I remember that. So read it and come ready. If you're online, read it. Join us. We'll see you. God bless you.